Well, Farrell, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, can we start by, can I ask you a little bit about your background, uh, where you were born, um, and a bit of your early stories about your life? Well, first I'd like to say thanks for having me. <laughs> um, and, well, I'm from, I was born in 1973 <laughs> in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, well, I was born actually in apartheid South Africa. So, um, early life, I guess, I mean, when you say that to people, they kind of think that, you know, wow, you know, apartheid and what was happening, of course, being someone of, of, of a slightly darker skin, it was challenging. But I think when you're little and when stuff is happening around you, you don't really realize what is happening, you know, in the sense of, for you, that's normal life. Mm -hmm. So for me, being discriminated against was normal, <laughs> you know, and as sad as that sounds. And I just remember one day, um, my parents were like moving house uh, or needing to move house anyway. And my mom was trying to find a new house and, and I was enthusiastically looking at the newspaper saying, wow, well, well, you know, look at this house, we can afford this. And my mom says, but we can't live there. And I was like, what do you mean we can't live there? She was like, we can't live there. That is where white people live, <laughs> you know? And I think that was like my first kind of real, wow, because our, our our whole situation was fashioned in such a way that we were kept so sick separate you know so what you then assumed was life wasn't really life you know and then only when you grow older and you started experiencing everywhere you go whites only whites only whites only benches beaches buses you know then it starts i think affecting you in a bigger way because you start realizing or i think you start buying into a bit of the lie that i'm not good enough I'm not enough, I want to say, you know? So yeah, I guess that's a little bit more about what my background was like as a child growing up in apartheid South Africa. It was really great though. I mean, it wasn't, like I said, we, um, my parents lived, my grandparents lived in like what we would call township township and we didn't live in a township, but I had both of those experiences kind of growing up. So um, my grandfather had all these wonderful, even though they were, sorry, in these, townships he had this beautiful garden with all kinds of fruits and vegetables and stuff like that and, and at that point I think you don't appreciate that so much but we grew up being able to just eat from these trees play under the trees climb the trees have mulberry juice all over you <laughs> you know it was really great I, I mean I loved my childhood but like I said it was tainted with all these things and I remembered at one point um, we an aeroplane came over you know and said there will be no school until further notice <laughs> like a little banner thing or whatever and we stayed at home and I think it was something like months later when we got to go back to school but of course we thought it was just one bad holiday mm -hmm. but it was obviously during the heavy um, kind of struggle part of South Africa where South African history anyway where there was lots of riots going on and lots of people you know kind of standing up against the regime mm -hmm. and for us as children, we were just kind of caught in between all of this, you know? So yes, there was like these phenomenal changes that was like gearing to take place in our country. But for us, it was, we didn't get to go to school, <laughs> you know? And then later on in my, my more like high school years, it started becoming a lot more serious, you know? Um, I was fortunate enough to go to a, what we termed at that point, a semi-private school, which was, which was run by Catholic nuns. Mm -hmm. So I had, as I said, very, very fortunately, a better education than most of my peers would have had at that point. But what that also meant was that we went kind of in the heart of, because the schools and everybody, particularly the high school students, got involved very much in saying, no, we will not stand for this, you know? And um, for us, we were kind of a little bit out of it. Um, and I remember one particular day though, um, we had decided we were gonna go pray with our, with the rest, because being a Catholic school, with the rest of the schools, in our area, we were going to go to this church and pray for our nation. And we were being very noble about it. And all these people were trekking through the streets going to pray for our nation. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we just saw kids started running in every different direction. We didn't know what was going on because all our nuns and things were with us, you know. And eventually, I mean, we knew at that point already, if something like that took place, you just ran. You didn't ask questions. You didn't stop. You ran. And we just ran and we ran into people's homes and people knew already they hid us underneath beds, in closets, in things because we didn't 
I mean, you can understand these is people that have no idea what's going on. We're just running in directions because we know it's got something to do with the police. And um, at the end of the story, we find out that it was because the police had been right in the front of the queue of, of the little walk that they were having. And they said to the students, if you don't run, we start beating. And the students said, no, we're not. We're just going to pray for our country. And they just whipped out the sham bucks and started beating them. So they just ran in all directions. And like I said, we followed suit. But it was a terrifying experience. I mean, being shoved underneath somebody's bed, not knowing what the heck is going on here, you know? And, and lying there for hours because these people knew that they needed to make sure that there was no police in the area before they let us out. Um, it was the funniest thing. A friend of mine, she ran right un out under her shoes. <laughs> and the two of us lying there, she's got one shoe on her foot, <laughs> you know. And um, and I remember getting this huge bruise on my side because I had banged it, just running against one of the, you know, the shop, the little locks on the, the shop's you know, windows or whatever. And it was just, yeah, but that was probably a scary experience, but it was just one scary experience, you know. Mm -hmm. For the rest of the time, I think I, I really had a wonderful childhood growing up in South Africa um, well I had better weather than Scotland <laughs> even though today is great but yeah so yeah I think that was childhood for me can you tell us a bit about uh, when and how you moved to Scotland um, what was the story of your arrival and your initial experiences here well I think first how I got to Scotland was that I came to a place in my life where in my career I had kind of, I've been doing really well, uh, both my husband and I, and, but you get to this place in your life, I think, where you start realizing there, there has to be more to this life than accumulating cars, houses, stuff. Mm. And I think that was, for me, what was kind of a changing point, was that realization that I wanted more. I wanted my life to matter more. So I kind of needed to take a moment to decide what was that going to be. I was in my, um, at that point it would have been my mid thirties. And I, I, my husband and I then decided to go take some time out in Switzerland actually. We went to stay with this community, like this really beautiful holistic community. And we, it was about six months of just exploring who we really were and what we really wanted out of life, you know? And it ended up long story short that we had decided to come and live in Scotland. Um, my husband is actually part Scott in the sense that he's not, um, he was born and raised in South Africa, but his family heritage is Scottish. Um, his, uh, grand, his father was actually born here. Yeah. And um, they, they left when he was very young, his, his father. And um, so for him, it was kind of returning back to some parts of who he was. You know, the stories growing up, hearing from his grandmother, things like that. So for him, it was kind of returning to some of that. Um, and we came here actually working with a Christian charity where I, I had gone, after we'd been to Switzerland, I went back to South Africa and, and um, got my coaching certification as a personal development coach. Um, and I came here and I started a coaching practice. And so, well, I didn't initially start the coaching practice, but yeah, we came here and um, that was basically the story of getting here, I think, you know, just that it was something else, it was, um, it was about starting something new, doing something new. But we also didn't realize what that meant. You know sometimes how that is, that you, you make a choice to do something different, but the nature of adventure is not always what you think it is, because it's not always just sunshine and roses. It's adventure, there's different experiences with it. So for me, as much as it was wonderful the first time we got here, but there was a lot of things I think that was challenging too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Can you describe your uh, early social and lifestyle experiences? Do you have family and friends that you socialize with uh, from your own background? We didn't, we didn't have many or much family here. We had, um, my husband has a, a second cousin that was still here. Um, and they were instrumental in helping us settle in. I mean, it was, they were fabulous, you know, collected us from the airport. The first, we actually, <laughs> we rented a house online and that was the worst decision ever. <laughs> and it was, I remember, in an area called Pultum because we didn't know what it was.
was like, right? So anyway, we got here and the guy who let us in the house said, listen, and we had, sorry, we had to pay something like six months or a year up front or something crazy like this because we were foreigners and to get our, our um, visa, we had to have accommodation set for a certain period of time. So <laughs> the guy says, look, I don't fix anything and I don't do anything. So in the sense of this is what you got and you just got to deal with it. We opened the taps and there is nothing happening. We, I was just, and the place was dirty. It was, and I was like, oh my gosh, I just come from my beautiful estate in South Africa and this is where I'm like living. So it was like, okay, this, this is going to be challenging, but let's see. So of course our, our second cousins had been at our home in South Africa and they were like, we don't think you can stay here. <laughs> yeah. So they said, come on, come home with us. So they took us, they lived in five. They took us home with them. And we said to the guy, keep the deposit, keep whatever, we don't stay in there. And it was so incredible. They, their next door neighbor, she uh, was in the military and um, she was gone for lots of periods of time. And so, I mean, here was this person that didn't know us from a bar of soap. She had a lovely home. She said, you guys can stay in my home. I'm not going to be here. She just met us and said, you guys can stay in our home. So then we had this home for, I think, three or four months. And she even refused to take any payment for it. So even though we had lost on the other side, here we gained. So even though, so it was this, this bittersweet situation, you know? And I think in most times in life, it's like that. And a lot, I think, depends on how you view stuff. Because it was like, we could have gone, ah, this sucks. This is but we just we just took it as a game and she offered us place to stay and then we were had this beautiful place it was far from where we had to work though so that was the, the only challenge because at that point you still had to come over the bridge and pay your pound every time you came over and went back you know? mm -hmm. so um yeah and then we as far as community went we because we came to work with a christian community that was actually really great they were a very kind of holistic kind of community and and we we immediately had things to do you know and things to get on with um, I used to, part of what I did for them was, was twofold. Uh, the first part was that I, I would plan a lot of events during the festival, that was my main function. So we'd have all these groups of people coming from all around the world to Edinburgh and I would kind of facilitate what they would do during the festival, so that was fab, I loved it. And then the second part of what I did was I spent, because we had students come here from all around the world, join the community and they'd stay here for a year and I had the opportunity to work with them and kind of coach them and and help them decide what they were going to do with the rest of their lives so that was exciting for me because we got to send people out there that really went and changed the world you know in what they were doing so that was exciting for me so yeah as far as community went that first year was great then something happened <laughs> we, we we were in property in South Africa this was our business and we took like a huge amount of our investment at the time and we put it into a, a thing that um, a guy from Zimbabwe had had offered us this opportunity and it was going great for the first few months because we then didn't have to work here in Scotland we could do what we loved and our whatever we earned they supported us fully and all of a sudden Mugabe goes crazy and the currency he devalues overnight we lose all of our money <laughs> and we're stuck in Scotland <laughs> and now we have to find jobs because now we cannot even afford to buy our, our children a 20p ice cream you know and coming from the lifestyle that we had in South Africa experiencing that was a traumatic to say the least but it was in a place of incredible growth what were your thoughts on the the culture of Scotland um, do you have any funny stories or any stories about discovering Scottish culture for the first time Really, I've come to really love Scotland and love love what Scotland represents, who the Scottish people are. It took me a long time. I don't think I even now, 11 years on, have gotten to truly know the Scottish people as I would like to. Because the one thing that I discovered was that Scottish people were very friendly, very welcoming. So I had, this was never really an issue for me. The only part of what I found very challenging was it was really hard to break through what I call a cultural screen. In the sense of, they're welcoming, but they keep you right there. Mm. Or oh, this is my experience. I don't know if this is true for everybody else, but this was my experience. 
And so I ended up in the 11 years making so many more friends from all around the world living here in, in Edinburgh and very, very few Scottish people. And only now for the first time and I, am I really meeting a lot more Scottish people that I am becoming friends with, you know? But I think that was for me the great thing. I, cause, and I think it was because it was so different to my own culture. South Africans are the kind of people you meet them and you're friends with them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like either you don't like them because they're not nice or you really like them. You know, like you, you just, I mean, you, you met me. <laughs> yeah. It's like you just, you become friends, you know? Um, and for Scottish people, it was like, they take the time. No, I don't think it's wrong or right. I just think it's different, you know? But it was challenging because I didn't know how to deal with that. How to get to, so what I eventually did was like, okay, I'm like, I'm here, but I'm just gonna, you know, be who I am. And, and at end, it meant meeting so many other expats from different countries. And because I guess they were all in the same boat, um, even some of them came from countries like Poland and other countries which you would normally assume would be called the people. But I think because they were in the same, same boat as you, they were just a lot more open. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, some of my best friends are Polish and Spanish and German and Italian and you know. But yeah, I, I built a community of people who I now call my family here. Do you see any similarities between your culture in South Africa and in Scotland? Similarities and differences. Let's start with the similarities. I think at the end of the day, people are people. And the thing that I found that is the same for all of us, no matter where I travel in the world, which is I love to travel, is that we all seek for some basic things. You know, and the one thing is, the biggest thing for me is we all want to love and we all want to be loved. And I think when you, when you get, when you break down all those other things, that for me is, that's why now, and why I've been able to make new friends and new people, because I try to practice that, you know, and the other part of the story I didn't tell was that I ended up marrying a white South African right out of apartheid, which meant my entire world blew up because everybody had something to say my non-white friends white people i mean it was it was horrible you'd walk in the street and we'd be scoffed at and i mean i at the beginning i remember saying to my now husband of 20 years <laughs> that you know what i don't think this is worth it i mean why do we have to go through this you know but at that point we really believed that we needed to be trailblazers we needed to show that it was not about the color of our skin and and I remember one day his dad um, grabbing him, you know, and saying to him, I don't care what you call me, call me a racist, but you find yourself a white woman. <laughs> you know? And he, I remember the poor dude, we we're walking on the beach and he was sobbing and crying and like, you know, like, I don't know what to do. And, and I was just like, Let's, why don't we just leave? And he was like, no, I'm not, you know? And we kind of, we kind of feel this was part of our journey as well as in like, what, what I believe what God wanted us to do. Because it was part of showing a nation, this can be done. You know, and was it about what you looked like and where you came from? It was about who you were. And clearly the two of us, 20 years on now, clearly we were, well, 22 years now, we are, we were suited to each other, you know? And um, the thing I learned from that was because at the beginning I was still coming in as the little brown girl, you know, and needing to figure out who I was. But I dropped that because it was challenging. I then decided at some point, in that beginning stages of this relationship, I went, no, I am a human being. And that's who I'm going to be here. And I'm going to demand respect, not through violence, through, but through being who I am, through being amazing. And we won over everybody's hearts in that way. His dad was at our wedding and sang our praises. I mean, now the family didn't even know what color skin I am because they realized who I was. And I think this is the same approach I took in Scotland. It's the same approach I take everywhere. And when I walk into a room, I do not see myself as different to another human being. I see myself as a human. And that has made so much of a difference, not only in my life, but in the life of the people that I encounter. Because I can truly say in Scotland, I've not encountered racism. Mm -hmm. Not because racism does not exist in Scotland, but I refuse to have them make me be a victim of their racist ideas. So when I walk into that room, I challenge, and not by what I'm saying to you, like as in, oh, don't be a racist, but the way that I present myself makes you understand 
you're not going to drive home with me here. And you can see the mind going, you know, but I walk out of that room and I'm your friend because I choose to, to be a human being. So I expect you to respond, you know, and people usually do because I don't think most people innately, most people are not, they don't want to be prejudiced. I think we are because we fear the things we don't know. So I think the minute that you play coy and you play the victim and you play the poor little person from the other side of the tracks or the brown or the cream or the black person, that's how people is, are going to see you. You know? So for me, it's getting this right. And then the rest of the world falls into place. So yeah, that was... So I just, like, like I said, the same experience I had in South Africa, it was, it was a place of pain, but it became the place of strength for me. And a lot of my work, even now in Scotland, involves a lot of that. Because I meet a lot of ethnic minority people who moan all the time about how they're being this and how they're being... And it's, I'm not belittling their experiences. I'm not saying that this does not exist. But I, what I have seen is what they think of themselves. They see themselves as far less than who they truly are. You know, and I think it's time that we see ourselves the way we are. We're incredible. You know, but we've got to live... We don't just, it's not something that just happens. We've got to actually do something to be that. You know, there's work involved. The seeds are there, but there's work involved in becoming the best version of yourself. How welcome did you feel when you first came to Scotland? Oh, I loved Scotland. I yeah. thought it was so, it was magical. You know, a funny little experience, you asked me that earlier, but a funny little experience was, I remember the first little while that we were here, my mother-in-law came and visited and we took her to the castle, you know, to take everybody to the castle. And I remember standing outside it, and there was this guard, he was like in his uniform and doing his thing. And you know how the guards are, they can't smile, they can't do anything, they just have people like straight faced. And I remember the wind, <laughs> <laughs> as the wind does in Scotland, we all know this, the wind decided, whoo, I'm going to blow. <laughs> and up blew his skirt. <laughs> oh, he's killed. <laughs> And oh wow, so we showed my mom-in-law much more than the castle <laughs> and he turned blood red. He could not move to adjust anything because he needed to be like, and I remember um, five minutes later, like somebody came over, like another guard and like replaced him so that he could just go and compose himself. <laughs> but it was funny. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so that was my experience of Scots do not wear underwear under those girls. <laughs> but yeah, I love, I loved, I, I think for me in particular Edinburgh, it was, arriving here was like magical. It was like, to me, the city has this incredible, charming -ness about itself, you know? And so I, I don't think even 11 years on now, I've, I've lost that, you know? I walk around the city and I, I'm so grateful that I get to live in the city um, and especially where I do live um, this is my backyard <laughs> and I get to I have what we call Arthur Seat which is just down around uh, as you know just around the bend from me and I get to walk there every morning and I get to have that in a city how many people could say that you know and it's one of the most beautiful spaces and I get to have this connection with nature this connection with my creator and and I get to see all these other people granted very often they don't greet me when I say good morning <laughs> but hey I'm sp I'm spreading the love <laughs> so yeah but yeah I, I there's lots of things about Scotland I can say that I love I love our water <laughs> um, I love that I can get on a bus at three in the morning and, and not feel too um, yeah at risk you know even though I don't but <laughs> I love that I can do it you know I do salsa dance, for example, and dance until three in the morning <laughs> lots of times. And so it's great that I can just get in my car and I can, you know, be safe and be home. And in South Africa, as much as I love it, and it's one of the most beautiful countries in the world, if you ever did have the opportunity to go, please make it a visit. You know, um, and especially my, my city, I'm from Cape Town. Um, I think just recently it was announced the most beautiful city in the world. So it wasn't for lack of beauty or or nature or anything like that, that I have not gone back to South Africa, but the country has really been challenged by crime, you know, for whatever reasons. And I think that is one of my big challenges is, um, and, and remaining here is that I feel safe. So that's what I like about Scotland and, and South Africa. Um, there is so much about it I love. 
but there is that one aspect where I feel unsafe. So yeah. Okay. Moving on to your sort of your current life now in Scotland, can you tell us a bit about what you do for a living and why how you got into that that chosen field? So I, I think I mentioned a little bit earlier, but I am a personal development coach. This is what I do and I founded an organization called Ignite Life. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of a backstory of why I founded it. Because about eight years ago, um, I was diagnosed with what they called a neuromuscular illness, which, or syndrome, which the diagnosis was, it was incurable, and I, I would probably um, land up in a wheelchair or bedridden and that there was not much they could do other than give me some drugs to mask some of the symptoms um, but basically I'm not gonna die of it but I have to just live with it it was very debilitating in the sense that at that point when it was diagnosed I would I was lying in a bed and and, and hardly moved from that bed you know um, I had picked up so much weight I I had all this fog going on in my head and at that prior to that I was already a personal development coach and it, it, but the thing was it was the, my coaching was about success was about reaching those goals in your life and you know going for it and things like that and and I lived my life like this too right so I've always been a very positive but the difference was I was a very driven person and I was disconnected from a lot of things being that way and one of the big things for me was nature. Like I did not understand my deep connectedness to my natural world. You know, I loved people. I, that connection was always there, but the connection with the natural world, I didn't understand how it was so important for me to protect it, for me to be a part of uh, recognizing that I'm not just protecting it, but that I'm a part of it. You know, and you can't take that out of your whole life experience. You can't, you, you can't be an accountant and forget that. You can't be an attorney or a judge or a teacher and forget that. This is a part of who we are. And at that place of pain, which was probably my darkest moment because really I felt like a failure because I felt like this person was supposed to be this hoo-hoo coach. I'm lying there and I can't move. So it was kind of this embarrassment, like a lot of stuff as well, you know? And I remember lying there and praying for myself because that was kind of what I, all I felt I could do. And being like desperate for something to happen. And this voice kind of inside of myself, which I now recognize as myself, <laughs> you know, was saying to me, you are here because of the choices that you made. Like in every area of your life, you know, the choices that you made about who you are, what you want, how you eat, how you take care of your body, how, you know, all of that, they have led up to where you are. And I thought about it for a moment and then I realized, but then it's time to make different choices. So I started and I started getting on the internet immediately and I started researching and doing all kinds of things. And in the process, I realized the first thing I needed to start with was my nutrition. And that was the first thing I tackled. And incredibly, within a month, I was out of that bed. And I'm talking about, I wasn't healed. I, I had all of the symptoms, but I was out of the bed. And now the journey could start. You know, by six months on, I was walking around Arthur's seat every day. I was, you know, I was, things was happening in my heart, my mind. I was getting the whole body, mind, spirit thing in place. And I walked around that hill for three years, discovering who I was in connection to nature, creator, others you know and developed this whole concept of ignite life which was founded on these five principles which is connection movement nutrition relaxation and purpose so it came out of my own space of pain because i subsequently realized that the things that break you are also the things that open up your heart you know it just depends on the choices that you end up making in your life everything who you are is choice Yes, there are factors we don't get to control. There are environmental factors and what other people do things. We don't get to control that, but we do get to control our reactions to those things. You know, and I think very often we just give away our power. So I think this is with all of that and with experiencing that and with growing through that and with 
getting a lot of that for my own self, it moved over into the natural thing of this is what I got to do as my life. So the whole thing of being a coach changed into having people have what I call what makes you come alive. So this is the topic I wrote my book about, which I wrote walking around there and and because every day I was inspired, you know, to write a new part of that book and because it was my own lessons, it was my own things that I was experiencing and I was now sharing this with the world, you know. Mm. Now in there also, one of the things I make so clear and part of the work that I do is this journey we get to go on in life, it is individual. There is no one size fits all. And we tend to want to have a formula because it's easy to follow that. Because the way that we were, I'm going to say, <laughs> hypnotized and the way we've been programmed is to take that pull, do that thing, do that, do that. We, want, we like to just follow because, because being a trailblazer, being a hero or a heroine, <laughs> you know, requires work requires you to go on a journey and requires you to dig deep and look at the things that are not right about who you are, that are not in line with the world and, and nature and creator and every, you know, not in line and not taking you to where innately, I know for every one of us, there is that voice inside that is screaming at you every day. You wake up and you hear that voice and some of us of course dull it with various different things, you know, but yeah, and so this is why I do the work that I do. So the organization kind of works around those five principles. And so I do lots of speaking engagements in Scotland. And I work with organizations like yourselves and like um, um, another organization called SEMPO, um, which is also working with ethnic minority people. And part of that work is, again, having these people see how incredible they are. They are not ethnic minority people. They are people. You know, and that is the message that I'm wanting to give to Scotland and to the ethnic minority people who live in Scotland. We are people. We're always going to have differences. You might have the same color skin, but you're always going to have differences because that's the thing. It's the spice of life. You and I have differences. It is when you and I can learn, celebrate what is different about ourselves, but yet still sit on this bench together and know that we're completely connected because the thing I discovered and something that John Muir said, he said, when you tug at anything in nature, it affects something else because we are connected. So my understanding is if I can play my role well in reshaping the interior worlds of the individuals, then hopefully those interior worlds can flow over into them recreating their exterior which is also the one I get to live in as well. <laughs> you know, so there's a little bit of, I want to say selfishness, but it's kind of like, I want a better world. So that's why I do what I do. And how did your heritage impact the work that you do? Because someone told me you can't. Someone told me on a sign every day of my life, I was less than. And at the beginning, it was about defying that. <laughs> you know, at the beginning it was how I'm going to show you I'm going to be enough. <laughs> you know, it was about that. So it came out of the wrong space to begin with, <laughs> you know. But as the journey went, the pain left and was now it became a, a, a different place. That's why I, say, I said earlier, your places of your greatest brokennesses, you know, your greatest kind of where, where your heart's torn apart is also the space where it can open your heart. Those same places. And that's what it did for me. So I think... I want to say I am grateful for growing up in apartheid South Africa. I am grateful for having fallen ill because it changed my life. And hopefully my life is changing many other lives. What are the achievements that you're most proud of? What achievements? <laughs> well, I'm going to say the, the, the ones that you would normally say, my kids. <laughs> but yeah, I am. I have two beautiful teenage daughters and I, I, I see them having the opportunities that I could never have and, I, and I'm hoping that they're going to grab those opportunities. I'm teaching them to grab that opportunity to become the absolute best version of themselves. Um, my oldest daughter, she's going to study cinematography and she, and the one thing I'm, I'm proud of is that she wants to make films that matter. 
you know so I think and she's an incredible writer as well so yeah I want to encourage her in that um, my youngest daughter however wants to take over her father's um, property empire <laughs> so let's see how that goes <laughs> yeah Great. can you tell us a bit about family life in Scotland uh, you've talked about your kids in Scotland now 11 years on well to begin with I think it was great raising my children in Scotland because I mean they were how old were they they were one was just one and a half and the other one was four so they are I, I didn't have this anguish in South Africa. Um, I don't know really why, but some of the reasons are that um, people, like we have quite an epidemic of AIDS, for example, and some of the crazy belief systems that people have is if they, um, if they have relations with a virgin, for example, their AIDS will disappear, and this is like ridiculous. So we tend to have this really high um, uh, percentage of like rape and things like this and and you tend to be kind of like paranoid about these things because you you know so for me even though I lived on this beautiful estate in South Africa and we we would have dogs and guards and and what do you call these things are like uh, electric fencers and bars on the windows you know all this kind of stuff um it's not who I am you know like I'm free I love nature I love you know this kind of thing and 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 Scotland allowed me to have that, so I'm grateful for that. And for the children, I could let them play. My daughters can go to school on a bus, can come, you know what I'm saying? And, and I really, I love that about family life and I love our green spaces. I love, even though it comes at a cost of a lot of rain. <laughs> but yeah, I grip my teeth and enjoy the rain <laughs> and the sun. So yeah. Great. And do you engage your, your family and close friends with your own heritage from South Africa and Scottish heritage as well? Yes, actually I, I am part of a group of people who started um, an organization called South, um, South Africans Living in Scotland. And so we do some fun things together and um, very soon we'll have our like our Freedom Day come up and so we will have like a, you know, I normally plan like a little get together or we'll have a barbecue because this is one of the things we love doing in South Africa because we have much more of an outdoor lifestyle, right? Because mm -hmm. of the weather. So barbecues are like right at the top of our list. So yeah, uh, so we do, we integrate a lot with that, I think. And so, I mean, I've not find, found that hard at all. Yeah. You know, I think in general, people like to learn about my culture and I, of course, like to embrace the Scottish culture. I think there's so many lovely things about it, you know? So yeah. Good. What aspects of Scotland would you say are most important to you? Or what do you feel like you most relate to? Democracy. And I, what I mean by this is, we live in a world right now that has what we call neoliberalist politics. And I am, I believe, even though it is of our own creation, I believe as we evolve as human beings, we're going to get closer to what I call true democracy. And so for me, I think Scotland in this world has a very important role to play in this. I, I believe I know why I'm here. You know, I, I, it's only the last few years that I completely understood that. Because I get to be a part of a government for the first time. I mean, I don't know how many people know this, but Scotland's government is one of the first governments who are willing to look at things like um, circular economy, for example. And circular economy is basically the economy that drives a different politics. So in other words, it's like, it's like um, uh, at the moment, capitalism is what drives and feeds our current politics, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that changes need to happen with that. And it's really hard because our politics is really controlled by um, the guys who have the money, corporations, not our politicians. And the things that I came to realize in Scotland for the first time as I, I attend a lot of these meetings, I, I try to be a part of making this nation positive because it's now the country that I live in, it's, it's my home. Mm -hmm. So I want to be a productive citizen. And part of that for me is one of the basic things, for example, is food in Scotland. And I have just been part of writing what we call the Good Food Nation Bill with an organization called Nourish. And I'm really, really proud of that because for me, um, 
we could be the first nation in Europe to have an agricultural system that goes organic and that thinks about our connectedness to everything, which means we could make history. And I don't want to say even history. I want to say, because I don't like making history. I want to be creating the future. And for me, that is the biggest thing about Scotland, is that I feel right now it is a country and it is a people that is wanting, that has the desire. We are far from where we need to be. But the thing is, we have this desire and we are, we are slowly reshaping. And I get to be a part of that. So that's exciting for me. <laughs> and what aspects would you consider of your own heritage that you are important and that you hold on to? I said it before, South Africans are this incredible kind of open people. And one of the things that I wrote about in my book was a little concept I call, or we in South Africa call Ubuntu. And I think this is something that we bring to Scotland, that I bring to Scotland, you know, as, as being a natural born South African, is Ubuntu is a Zulu um, concept that is basically, it says, I am because you are. And the thing about this that in South Africa, I never appreciated, um, for a few years before I came to Scotland, I lived in the north of South Africa. And so in the north, we have a lot more um, kind of uh, Zulu people. Um, and so every time I'd walk up to the counter and I'd give my you know, stuff to be rung up at the till, um, the lady would first look at me and say, Sabona. And then she'd wait until I responded. Sometimes I'm in a hurry and I just want to like, just get off with it so that I can go, you know? And later when I learned about this concept of Ubuntu, when they say Sabona, they are saying, I see you. So, and that I think is one of the greatest parts of what I want to bring and what I want to hold on to of my culture is I am because you are. When you need a cup of tea, when you need a shoulder to cry on, when you need a hug, when you need some cake, when you need a plate of food, I want to be there. You know, and I want to be able to pass this on to people in Scotland. I mean, of late it's been, uh, like I said, people, we don't, we, we meet in pubs, we meet in things, but what about our homes? Like, come on, have a meal with me. Mm. I want to bless you. I want to, you know, like, I think there's some of that missing for me. So, instead of moaning about it, I feel like I want to be part of making that happen and letting it rub off on everybody else. <laughs> so, yeah. Have your feelings about Scotland changed at all over the years? Yes. I mentioned right at the beginning when you were talking about some of my story, when I said to you there was this hard moment where we kind of lost all of our money that was supporting us and we had to find jobs. And I remember my husband having to find like a construction type job you know he was hauling stones or something i don't know <laughs> he was just hard and he came home very 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 tired he'd never done this in his life you need to understand he was a white south african <laughs> white south africans do not do hard work <laughs> i mean like in apartheid you know they were the boss that's hard work so but him coming here and having to do that was really funny and for me you know what was one of the funniest things just going to Scotland and seeing white people work on the street or do something like that because in South Africa white people do not do those jobs mm -hmm. you know so it was culturally funny for me you know to see that happen so I'm <laughs> just saying that you need to understand coming from a home I mean my home I have two swimming pools like back home you know I have landscape gardens on my one property 17 homes so coming from that to not being able to buy my child a 20p ice cream was horrific mm -hmm. and i remember at first he got a job with a property company and this guy was amazing still today the fact that he gave him that opportunity turned our, our lives around because mm -hmm. then we needed to find jobs so he he went in um and it was cleaning houses and doing like um uh, what do you like decorating and things like this you know and so one of the things I would do is help him maybe sometimes clean the houses. Now this, I had a full-time maid back in South Africa. So this is just me cleaning toilets. And, and this was just not normal cleaning. It was cleaning where, oh my gosh, puke everywhere, condoms in places, every possible piece of 
of cutlery and crockery under beds. It was just horrific stuff. So anyway, cleaning this up, I remember standing over this toilet where somebody had just puked all over the place and I was just like crying saying why are you doing this just go back home you know <laughs> like you don't need to be doing this mm. however that being said in that moment there was this thing that said to me inside again that voice saying you are crying because you define yourself by what you do and not who you are and in that moment, again, I made a decision. Doesn't matter if I'm in the boardroom, if I'm cleaning a toilet, if I'm on television, if I'm giving an interview. I'm going to define myself by who I am, not what I do. So everything changed. I dried my tears. Everything turned. And today, my husband has a really successful property management company, investment company from cleaning toilets. So I'm saying, the physical changed in Scotland because my interior changed. And now I welcome challenges because I know they are the places of my greatest growth. Do you feel a part of Scottish society? I do. I feel a part of and not a part of. But I don't see that as a bad thing because I don't just want to be part of Scottish society. I want to be someone that is always looking outside of boundaries. So even the way that I look is very interesting. I mean, my features, physical features. Often, as I said, I do salsa dance. So often, nobody ever guesses that I'm born in Africa. Um, I have a very mixed background in the sense that, yes, I was born in Africa, but I have Culturally, I am mostly Malay, actually. My family is from Malaysia and uh, originally, and part Arab, part Indian, so I've got a lot of mixtures there going on. But, and so, and before it was kind of a feeling of I don't belong. But again, as I say, as the interior world changes and the perspective changes, it was like, oh my gosh, I belong everywhere. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? So instead of looking at I don't belong, actually, I belong everywhere. So I'm comfortable being anywhere. And so, yes, I do see myself very much a part of Scotland and a part of, of the landscape of Scotland and part of the people of Scotland. Um, in fact, <laughs> how I saw that I was really, really becoming Scottish, not the accent, yes. <laughs> I refuse to give up my accent. <laughs> However, um, <laughs> I went down to London a little while ago on a business trip and um, they refused to take my Scottish money. I was appalled. <laughs> I was having, and I don't usually have fights, but I was like, dude, this is ignorance. <laughs> like Michael McIntyre said, I said, this is legal Scottish tender. <laughs> I was doing all of that, you know. But honestly, I really, for the first time, I kind of really felt some Scottish pride in this sense. That I felt like, if we're going to be a part of the United Kingdom, then surely you should at least know that our money is valuable. You know what I'm saying? And if you can't even accept that basic thing, the guy on the street, because clearly it is not the guy on the street's fault, it's because they are not taught that we're a part of. And so the first time I was like, now I want Scottish independence. <laughs> so yes, I'm voting yes. <laughs> How has moving to Scotland affected your life? I know that's quite a big question. I mean, anywhere you go will change you. But I don't know that I would have had the same experiences back in South Africa. I was part of a middle, upper class scenario that, I mean, because look, I grew up in, I, I wasn't, we weren't extremely wealthy. As I said, I had the whole township thing going on. And, and what you guys understand as not being wealthy is not what we understand as not being wealthy. It was challenging, you know? Mm. And my own personal family was, I would say, middle class, you know? Um, but then getting, you know, marrying my husband, I, kind of moved up a class, let's put it that way, you know. And our friends were, I mean, they were lovely, you know, <laughs> they still are. <laughs> but so much of our lives involved our homes and our cars and our, do you know what I'm saying? And, and, and I, inside of who I am, I knew there was to be more than that. And if I did not leave that scenario, I don't think I would have, I would be who I am today. So, 
Scotland changed me. I think into being more of who I'm supposed to be. Wow. Um, in general, do you feel immigration has a positive effect on Scotland? I think so. First thing, <laughs> sorry, this is funny. <laughs> I was just going to say, you have a bunch of mixed race kids now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I think, as I said, the minute we are separate and we don't see ourselves as human, we have a serious problem. And I'm not just talking about the fact that, okay, um, you know, for trade and things like this. I'm talking about the fact that we don't have anywhere else to go. We've been trying for a while already, you know, trying to find other worlds. We haven't found them yet. So what that means is we're all stuck right here together. If we don't get it together, I believe the earth is an incredible being. It's alive and it will renew itself. It always has. And we, if we don't get with the program, we are gonna become collateral damage. And that wouldn't be the Earth's fault or anybody else's, but ours. So I'm saying that I started realizing about why should I be concerned about somebody that's hungry on the other side of the world? Oh goodness, I have food on my table. Why should I be so concerned? In fact, because at one point in my life, I was like, I just want to be concerned about myself for now because I'm always seeming to be concerned about everything else in the world, you know? And realized because that's what I was created for. And there was a reason. Because until I get, and I'm not talking about the fact that I just say it, like as in, I am connected to everything else so that I can sound profound. But I am connected to everything. When I do an action here on this part of the planet, it affects that other part of the planet when they do it there. So when people who are poor, who are in absolute poverty, most of those people are not educated. What does that mean? It means, I mean, I, I'm not gonna say that they are stupid because no human being is stupid. No human being is ordinary. There is a hero, there is a titan, there is a, 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 a someone with an amazing gift to the world in every human, but it has to be nurtured. And what happens with people, I, 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 in part of my studies, one of the things I, I, I've learned was something called, uh, or developed by Abraham Maslow, which is about the hierarchy of human needs. And what happens is in that scenario, when you are at the bottom of that kind of pyramid, which is where a lot of the developing world people are sitting in the sense of you only wearing a t-shirt and you're fishing every day and you literally trying to just make sure that your family has a roof or a something you know you don't have the time to think about anything else you don't have the time the energy the know-how to think beyond that scenario you move us up which is where a lot of the developed world sits someone love me oh I'm depressed oh I'm that you know what I'm saying like I'm not trying to make small of these things but the reasons we are at those spaces and places because we don't understand we are not changing our interior worlds we are just allowing everything to blow us in the wind, like emotions, oh, okay, that person makes me sad, that, that person does not make you sad, you make you sad. That person can do whatever they want to do. You have the choice whether you are going to give your power to that individual to affect you. So, for me, I, I feel like until we understand, truly, truly understand this connectedness, this is what I'm saying about Scotland and why I feel like it's not about being Scottish. You know what I'm saying? It's not about drawing that border and immigration shouldn't do that. But immigration has allowed us to see a greater world. It's to see people of other cultures, to see other things. And this is a good thing. And travel has allowed Scottish people to leave and to, you know, we need to leave our little world so that it can grow and it can become bigger and we can be connected and we can understand why it is important for me to be concerned about somebody that's hungry, to be concerned about the person that is, um, you know, a Syrian refugee or, a, and why should I be concerned about bums that are being dropped on the other side of the world? Why should I not just be in my little bubble? Because actually, eventually, it will affect me. And I think my whole concept of the fact that I am individual, but I am also collective.
And like I say, not just in words, but truly, truly getting that. Because then I'm going to want to care for you. Because I understand that my fate is intertwined with yours. Humanity's fate right now, it is intertwined with nature. And the final question is, um, have you noticed a change at all um, in people's attitudes in the recent years with things like the EU referendum and other various votes that have happened in the last few years here in Scotland and around the world? I said it before, not towards myself because I don't allow them to. However, I do experience a lot of fear in people, the way people talk. Like, everybody, as I said, they, I, you know what, <laughs> this is the craziest thing. I don't listen to the news at all. Because it is always only a perspective. I think you understand the world much more when you actually get into the world, when you actually spend time with people rather than, like I said, travel to that country if you want to know about it. But you let somebody else tell you what is actually happening there? And you let that shape your mind? Of course you're going to believe the lies. There is so much about what our world, what we see as our world right now, that is just lies. And anybody can manipulate us like that. But again, I say back to, it requires work. Like part of for me, like I spend so much of my time educating myself, just learning things about everything <laughs> because I want to know these things. I want to be able to, when I'm having a discussion, it, it, I want to be able to bring something of value to that. So for me, when it comes to politics, I'm not, I don't care about who's in power and who I'm voting for. I care about the fact that our food. Are you going to touch our food? Now tell me about that. I want to know about agriculture. What is, if I go, what does that mean? You know, and right now, from what I understand, <laughs> you, in politics now, instead of people going and doing that and spending time, they would rather listen to 150 different voices and then they make their decision, which is not necessarily the decision for you. So one of the, the, the principles, I want to say the little mantra that I've built Ignite Life on is the following. It is always remain open to new ideas, approaches, products, technologies, and services. But do your own research and then couple that knowledge with your instinct in order to make the best and the wisest choice for yourself and our entire ecosystem. And I think when, to do that, you have to go do your own research. And so my encouragement is, if you really want to vote the right way, go spend time. That's what I do. I go to meetings. I go to things. I go to, you know, I, I, I ask questions. I, I try to figure out, okay, why do I have to go? Not just because, oh, I just want Scottish independence. What do I care about Scottish independence? Mm -hmm. But what does that mean? Yes, at this moment, I would vote for Scottish independence for this reason. That I believe it would be the best for our, our agriculture and for our lives right now as people living in Scotland. And because we then get to have a greater voice as to where we want to take this nation and having this nation become a trailblazer to so many things in this world. And again, our, our politicians, let's hold them accountable. Let's not because we voted for you today and today you said uh, this is what we're going to do. If tomorrow you change your song, you're out. As a people, we need to start understanding that we have power. You know, we're not without power. And we oftentimes, the situation seems so big that we just, we sit back, you know, and we go, you know, what can I do about it? You can do something about it in your own life, firstly, and you can get up and say no. You know, and, and I don't mean violence. I don't mean any of that kind of stuff. I'm saying, I like the same way, like I said to you, the way that I see myself as a human being, and I woke up and I and I talk to you and I talk to you like you are a human being because that's confidence. Confidence isn't being this arrogant individual. It is being the fact that I completely value what I bring, but I also completely value what you bring. You know, so I'm saying the same thing. When you walk up there, we have the right to say to our politicians, "Why are we doing that? Why oh, do we have 20?" <laughs> 20 miles per hour throughout Edinburgh, <laughs> you know, driving. I'm just saying, why do we do these things? We just accept it and we go, oh, this is the way it is. It's not just the way it is. You know, we have to, but because we're, 
we're so just about our own selves and our own families and our own things, you know. And we, when we put, do that in the collective, we land up where we are. But the same way when we do it in the collective of what is happening outside of myself. But the reason I can't do that is because I don't go inside of myself. So I don't have the capacity to go outside of myself. You know, so I spoke to you a little bit earlier and I said that's why what I decided to do in my life was to spend time with me in my interior world. Reshuffling, reshaping, re-challenging, re all the time. And hopefully that spills over into me redecorating <laughs> the exterior world. <laughs> you know? So yeah. That's great. Thanks so much. Uh, that's the end of the interview. So uh, Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was yeah, great. That was really good. <laughs>